Greetings to all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. What I thought I would like to do for this uh, midweek meditation, and I am not committing to doing one of these um, every midweek, but as I read through the lectionary texts, which I hope uh, you're engaging, uh, this week you'll notice the first week of Easter, the week after Easter, if you will, the readings are dominated by a, a string of texts, all from 1 Corinthians 15, clearly the grandest, most extensive unpacking of the glory of the resurrection that we have in the New Testament. <clears throat> and so um, I thought I would um, do a sort of flyover uh, of chapter 15, not addressing um, every issue that's raised that would that would take much much longer than we have but trying to make a couple of, of big points about the easter season which we're in for we observe easter for seven sundays we observe it all the way to the ascension of christ and the readings are are key to that in the lectionary as you'll notice in fact in this coming week this present week that we're in now um, the readings come from first peter also another text focused on the resurrection glory of Christ. So, 1 Corinthians 15, I want to break this up maybe into three sections. <clears throat> the first is the first 10 or 11 verses. Paul says, now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. Notice, the gospel is received by us. It, it's, it's sent from heaven. We open our hands and we receive it. But it's also the gospel in which we are standing, meaning at this present hour, we stand by the gospel. We didn't just stand by the gospel in the past. We stand by it in the present. And by which you are, present tense, being saved. So that we need the gospel, not just for the beginning of the Christian life, but for the middle and for the end and for every point in between. We are not saved by faith and then maintained in the covenant by works. We, we stand in the gospel and we are being saved by the gospel of free and glorious grace. If we hold fast to the word that was preached. So we stand in the gospel, we cling to the gospel. Otherwise, Paul says, we would be believing in vain. We need the gospel every single day. We need it in our own hearts and in our own minds and in our own lives. For I delivered to you, Paul says, as of first importance, what I also received. So the gospel is of first or of chief or of prime importance. This goes to the, to the slogan I always use, order and proportion. What are the highest things? What are the, the, the best things? What are the biggest things? What are the most important things? And the gospel is a thing of chief importance. I always think of the former editor, now with the Lord, Richard John Newhouse, who was the editor of the, um, the Journal of Religion and Public Life, known as First Things. And Newhouse, he had a journal called First Things. And he used to always say that the first thing to be said about politics is that it's not the first thing. And that's a very helpful reminder of how it, important it is to keep things in place in life. Paul says this is what's of first importance. This is what you are standing by, and this is what you are being saved by. This, this is what it is. Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. This is the core of the Catholic faith, the core of the creed, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Christ, this is of first importance. This is something we not merely confess, but we live by. And that he appeared. And then he goes through this remarkable catalog of, depending on how you count, 600 plus witnesses to the resurrection. He appeared to Cephas, the Aramaic name for Peter. Then to the 12. Then this remarkable statement found only in 1 Corinthians. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. This is a remarkable sentence. If you figure that 1 Corinthians was written in the early 50s, you know, 52 AD, something like that, and Paul says, I received this 
tradition about the resurrection. I received it, I handed it on to you. So the tradition goes back into the 40s, probably into the, into the 30s. It goes back to the resurrection itself. And he says, Christ was raised. We know he appeared to Peter. He appeared to the other apostles, but he appeared at, there was an appearance where he appeared to more than 500. Notice, not 500, more than 500 at one time. At one time. I mean, it'd be one thing to say that a few people had some sort of psychological event where they imagined they saw the risen Christ. But you would have more than 500 people here, and for them to have testified that Christ appeared to them would, would have to be some sort of act of mass delusion. What's, what's also interesting here is Paul says, most of whom, most of these 500 plus people are still alive. So he knows the proportions, like he knows more than half of them are still living, though he says some have fallen asleep, some have died. So, he, so the church knows these people. Paul knows them, and he's basically saying to the Corinthians, look, you can go talk to them. You can interview them. There's not just Peter and the apostles. There's these 500 saints, and we're, we're keeping track of them. We know which ones are still living. Then he appears to James, then to all the apostles probably different than the 12. The, the 12 is the core apostles, but the word apostle is used broadly to mean all sent out into the church to work. So he's piled up something like 600 witnesses to the gospel. And I think, you know, if we didn't have this text in Corinthians, we wouldn't know about that one particular event. So it's very important to see that Paul does appeal to this, this sort of public, publicly certified evidence for the resurrection of Christ. And last of all, he says, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me, for I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. So we have the testimony of Peter and the twelve. Now, Paul has actually left the women out of the story here, who we know Jesus appeared to also, perhaps because he was adducing for his Greek audience legal witnesses. But for whatever reason, we have, we have Peter, we have Cephas, we have Peter and Cephas, same person. We have the 12, we have the 500, more than 500, and then we have Paul. And, and if we only had Paul's testimony, right, we, we would have an enormously powerful witness because Paul recounts his conversion story, his road to Damascus conversion. He recounts it five times in the New Testament, across the span of his life. He had plenty of opportunities to, re to recant it or to adjust it or to modify it or to look back on it or to edit it or to repudiate it, but he doesn't. And Paul, even the most critical, um, the most skeptical um, biblical scholarship, except some core eight or 10 Pauline letters, depending on the scholar, uh, as authentically Pauline, every, like in other words, everyone knows Paul was a living person, that Paul wrote these epistles and, and, and the ones they think, you know, are not written by Paul, they would, they would maybe say someone close to Paul, someone in Paul's circle wrote them. So we have a historical witness here. They're all historical witnesses, but Paul himself, if we look at his letters, we have a pastor who's sane and sober and brilliant and gifted and who has suffered for the faith. I think have always felt that Paul's witness alone outweighs the witness of all modern atheistic skeptics to the resurrection. Because Paul was a skeptic, and Paul was an enemy, and Paul is an eminently sane witness. So these are not just witnesses. These are really um, ferocious witnesses on the side of the resurrection. Paul puts himself last because he was a persecutor of the church. But notice what being encountered by the risen Christ did for him. He says in verse 10, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them. He was the hardest working apostle. Though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. So the resurrection encounter with Christ is really the thing which pulsated and drove Paul's apostolic labors, which are really Herculean labors. There are lists in his writings of the beatings and the sufferings and the afflictions 
and the persecution and the opposition and the, and the, the draining nature of what he did. But this was sustained by the grace of the risen Christ to him. Resurrection meant a kind of realistic, robust labor for the apostle, and it should for us. So he says, whether, whether then it was I or they, so we preached and you believed. It's a critical passage. This passage is often preached on Easter Sunday, along with the other portions of chapter 15, because of its centrality in setting forth the resurrection of Christ, the witnesses to it, and the prime importance of the gospel by which you're saved and in which you stand. And Paul moves on from here. He's spoken of the resurrection of Christ. But now he wants to talk about the resurrection of the dead in general. Because in Corinth, being influenced by Greek philosophical thought as it was, some taught that the dead are just not raised. And since the dead are just not raised, then the Lord Jesus Christ could not be raised. Now Paul's going to repudiate this. But it's important to see that Paul will not have a spiritual resurrection or a kind of ghostly resurrection or a resurrection in the mind and memory of the apostles toward Jesus. Nor will he have this notion that Christ sort of floated off into heaven and all we really need is the immortality of the soul. The Christian faith insists and it, it rides on the resurrection of the body. So there were some in Corinth saying the dead are not raised. And if the dead are not raised, well, then Christ would not be raised. And Paul says, look, if that's the case, you're still in your sins. Our preaching is futile. Your faith is futile. Those who've fallen asleep in Jesus, those who've died in the faith, have perished. If we hope in Christ in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. We certainly have hopes for the gospel and for Christ's work in this life. But if that's all we had, we would be pitiable. At the heart of our gospel proclamation is resurrection from the dead. And so he turns in verse 20 and says, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. So now he's talking about the resurrection of the dead in general and, and connected with that, the resurrection of the just, of believers. Notice what he says. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Such an important notion. Christ is the first fruits of the eschatological harvest. When, God, when Christ comes in glory to judge the living and the dead, all the dead will be raised. There'll be a general resurrection at the end of the age. But that general resurrection is already underway. This is very difficult for us to grasp because we tend to think of time and history as just a linear succession of moments. But Jesus' resurrection is not separated from the resurrection, the general resurrection of the dead at the end of the age. It is, in fact, the reaping of the first fruits of that coming harvest. It's a glorious thing. Paul is always linking Christ's resurrection to our coming bodily resurrection. They are the same harvest. So what has happened is the time has been foreshortened, Paul says. This coming resurrection now sits on top of us, if you will, breaks into our time in the resurrection of Jesus. That's what the, the, the um, first fruits means. For by a man came death, by a man also comes the resurrection of the dead. So Adam brought death into the world. Christ will bring resurrection from the dead, not just his own resurrection from the dead, but a general resurrection from the dead. Right? As in Adam, Paul says, all die, so in Christ all shall be made alive. And by here he means eschatologically alive and resurrected glory in immortal bliss. So again, Paul goes from Adam to Christ, from Adam's sin to the full resurrection of the dead. But he says, but this, there'll be an order to this. He says, Christ, the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Right, the first fruits, then the rest of the harvest. Then comes the end. He delivers up the kingdom uh, to God the Father after destroying all rule and authority and power. So you have Christ coming, then the end. And then Paul speaks of a few things that are clustered to the end, destroying all authority and rule and power, reigning till he puts all enemy un under his feet, destroying death itself. Verse 27. 
God has put all things in subjection under his feet. For when it says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that he is accepted who put all things in subjection under him. And when all things are subjected to him, the son himself will be subjected to the father so that God might be all in all. So there's this vision of Christ, the first fruits, the coming resurrection of the dead, the destruction of all evil, and a situation where God is all in all. This is the grand vision of the church. The resurrection of Christ guarantees your resurrection, the general resurrection at the end of the age, and that guarantees the destruction of all rule and authority and power and the destruction of death itself, and it guarantees that God will be all in all. Now, it's interesting that Paul shifts here to something very concrete and practical. He says, otherwise, what do people mean by being baptized on behalf of the dead? Now, we don't know what this practice is. There's a lot of speculation, but whatever it is, Paul does not commend it. He just notes that people do it. But his point here is, well, if the dead are not raised at all, why would someone even be baptized on behalf of the dead? And then he speaks to his own ministry. Why are we in danger every hour? In other words, why do we suffer? Why do we sweat? Why do we toil? Why am I doing what I'm doing, right? I protest, brothers, he says, by the pride that I have in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die every day. I'm dying. I carry about in my body the dying of Jesus. What do I gain, he says? If humanly speaking, I fought with beasts at Ephesus, probably a, a, you know, an encounter with maybe the cult of Artemis or Diana there or the opposition that was uh, presented against the gospel there, right? Paul depicts his enemies that he's struggling with in his apostolic ministry as wild beasts. He's dying himself. He's confronting enemies without, he's confronting hostility. And, he, and he's saying, if the dead are not raised, let us eat, drink, for tomorrow we die. He quotes a, a pagan poet there. In other words, the future coming resurrection, right? what I like to call the eschaton, the end, that is what's driving Paul to labor, to suffer, right? To, to do this now. If you ask Paul, why are you doing this? He would say, I'm doing it in hope of the resurrection of the dead. I preach the gospel of prime importance. And part of that gospel is that Christ, the first fruits, will come in glory to raise the dead to destroy death, to put down all rule and principality and powers. So he says, if the dead aren't raised, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. There's no in-between position for Paul. He doesn't think, well, if the dead aren't raised and we live in a sort of meaningless cosmos, we should try and be good people. You know, I don't think you have to believe in God to be ethical and to be a good pe person. You hear a lot of that today. Paul will have none of that. Look, if the dead aren't raised, Eat, drink, be merry, tomorrow you die. Then he goes on and says, don't be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Probably here he's referring to people in Corinth who are undermining the belief in the bodily resurrection of the dead, right? Again, they're perfectly happy with the immortality of the soul, but they don't believe in a bodily resurrection of the dead. Wake up, he says, from your drunken stupor, right? To live without the light of the risen eschatological coming Christ is to just live in a kind of stupor, he says to them. Don't go on sinning, for some have no knowledge of God, he says, I say this to your shame. Those who are denying the resurrection, they don't even know God. And you should not be seduced by them. You should wake up from your stupor. So that's the resurrection of the dead and our coming resurrection. Then. He answers a question, but someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? What's the resurrection body like? I mean, people are curious about these things. Uh, pastors get questions like this all the time. Uh, and it's interesting, Paul's getting these questions and he spends a good amount of ink between verses 35 and 49 answering that question. I wanna point out just a couple things here and, and maybe do a little bit of uh, in, encouraging you from these, from these words. So he points out that there are different kinds of flesh, different kinds of bodies, 
they have different kinds of glory. The glory of the sun is not the glory of the moon. The glory of the stars differ from one another. Um, he says, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. He, he, he starts with a seed. What, and what you sow is not the body which is to be, but it's like a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat, he says, or some other grain. Right? And in verse 42, he says, so it is with the resurrection of the dead. So notice, he makes an important point here. There is it going to be a serious discontinuity between your body presently and your body of glory. It's like the discontinuity between a seed, which is put into the ground, and the body which God gives the seed, the thing it turns into. There's continuity there to be sure. It will be you that are raised. But you will be raised in a transfigured glory, which has substantial discontinuity from your embodied existence in this age. So he says, so it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. Now he's talking about our bodies being sown into the earth. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. Glory is an eschatological word, right? It is sown in dishonor, raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. So you have a, you know, a triplet. On one side, you have perishable, dishonorable, weak. That's what this body is. That's how it's sown into the earth. On the other side, you have imperishable, not able to perish, glory, power, conformity, Paul says, to his glorious body. It is sown a natural body. Here he means just a normal human body, a body that belongs to this age. He doesn't mean a body without a soul or anything like that. Even, even a body of a Christian that has the Holy Spirit is a natural body here. So it's sown a natural body, but it's raised a spiritual body, meaning a body completely animated, completely pervaded, completely quickened to life and light by the, by the spirit of the risen Christ. If there is a natural body, then there is a spiritual body. Paul goes right from the creation. If God created Adam with a natural body, then there's an eschatological raised body. A spiritual body here means a resurrected embodied body fully transfigured by the light of the spirit. That is your destiny. And if God made that original body, a natural body, then Paul argues there is a glorious eschatological body. If creation, then eschaton. Even before the fall, the whole created order was aimed at coming heavenly, face-to-face -face communion with God in transfigured glory. So, then he does this. He says, thus it is written, the first man, Adam. Now, he hasn't introduced Adam before. He just said, if there's a natural body, there's a spiritual body. Or put it this way, if there's a body of, that belongs to this age, then there's a body that belongs to the resurrected age to come. Then he says this, the first man, Adam, became a living being. Now, he's referring to Adam's body. The last Adam, that's Jesus, became a life-giving spirit. Again, the point is not that Jesus became like a ghost. It means he was resurrected in the power of the Spirit, and he is dominated and controlled and conditioned by the Holy Spirit in his body. So the first Adam is a sort of natural man. The second Adam is a life-giving spirit. But it's not the spiritual that's first, Paul says, but the natural, then the spiritual. So the first man is from the earth, a man of dust, the second man from heaven. Again, when Jesus is called the man from heaven, we are not talking about his incarnation. We're talking about his resurrection. His resurrection makes him a heavenly man. Now, this, this is somewhat dense. This is one of the, the, uh, the dense passages in Paul. But I want to just point one thing out that's important to see here. I don't want you to, to, to miss this. Paul is comparing the glory of, the, the, of your resurrection body with the current body that you have in this age. On the one hand, right, you have glory and power and imperishability. On the other hand, you have perishability, dishonor, and weakness, right? That's this body, which is sown into the ground, compared to Christ's own resurrected body, which you shall have one of when he appears. But then he does this. He introduces Adam as an example. Adam as an example of a natural body. Adam before the fall. So if you could go all the way back to Eden and wipe all the sin out of the world, 
and get back to Edenic conditions where Adam is there and Adam has not sinned yet. Death has not entered the world yet. Adam is not fallen. Paul classes or he categorizes or he places Adam's body before the fall. When he compares it to Christ's body, he classifies it on the side of bodies that are weak, perishable, and dishonorable. Even Adam's body in Eden is infinitely less glorious than the body that you're going to have in the risen and eschatological Jesus. So he goes on and he says, as was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. Right? As was Adam, so are also all the children of Adam with respect to their bodies. As is the man of heaven. That's the, re that's the resurrected Jesus. He's the man of heaven. He's the heavenly man now. So also are those who are of heaven. Heaven is your destiny, right? Heaven is your homeland. Jesus is the man of heaven. He is raised in eschatological, transfigured, embodied glory. And so it will be for those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, right? We, we are we're made after the image of Adam. We're still in the image of God, but we're like Adam was. We're made in the image of God. So we shall bear the image of the man of heaven. So when we think of this, right, it's important to see that the image, that you were endowed with the image of God, man was endowed with the image of God at his creation. And that image endowment, that being made in the image of God, is itself pointed toward eternal eschatological glory. The image is meant to give man risen, heavenly, face-to-face -face fellowship with God in a renewed order even from the beginning, even from before the fall, just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, so we shall in the future bear the image of the man of heaven. Jesus being the man of heaven, the man who now dwells in the highest heavens and now whose very body reflects heavenly splendor and light and glory. It's a beautiful picture when we think of, now we are being renewed in this image now. Right now, through the gospel, you're being conformed to the image of Christ. That is the sovereign electing purpose of God, to conform you to the image of Christ. But that conformity will reach its apex and its glory, its escalation beyond what has begun in this age when you are raised from dead and your body is conformed to his glorious body. It's a marvelous passage. So Paul has moved from the resurrection of Christ to the resurrection of the dead in general, to the resurrection of the body. So glorious is the resurrection of the body that even Adam's body is classed with our dying bodies. And then he ends with this extraordinary exhortation, uh, a stirring end of the chapter. He says, I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. What he means here is flesh and blood so here, inherit, inherit is an eschatological word. It refers to our future inheritance. You get your inheritance at the end. You get a down payment of your inheritance now through the spirit, a pledge, a promise. But the inheritance itself is reserved for the end. Here, he's also using kingdom of God as future. The kingdom is also present. Christ is king now. The kingdom is advancing now. But in this case, kingdom is a holy future reality. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And what he means by that, and this is clear from the context, he means that your, your bodily existence, flesh and blood as currently constituted, the kind of flesh and blood that's gonna be sown in weakness and in dishonor, right, in perishability, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the eschatological kingdom, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. There are two different orders of existence here. Flesh and blood as currently constituted cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Perishability, which is the, the attribute we now have as embodied creatures, the attribute of our bodies, perishability cannot inherit the imperishable. But behold, Paul says, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, meaning die, but we shall all be changed in a moment. This, this happens in a flash, in an instant. In the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable. Imperishable. This is another order, an escalated order of existence, well beyond what Adam had in Eden. The dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. 
we shall be changed from weak and corruptible and perishable, from being sown in dishonor. We shall be changed. For this perishable body must, this must happen. This is God's decreed purpose manifested in the resurrection of Jesus. This perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. And when the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then, then, meaning at the appearance of Jesus, at the end of the age, at the last trumpet, when the dead are raised, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? And we saw that text quoted, right? Cited in the Isaiah 25 text, which was preached on Easter. Isaiah cites this text, uh, uh, uses this language. Hosea uses similar language too about death being swallowed up in victory. And when death is swallowed up in victory, the veil, right? The veil of perishability and weakness and corruptibility and dishonor, which shrouds human life, right? Which, which, which um, causes our bodies to fail and to disintegrate and to return to dust, right? The veil is swallowed up and the nations come into Zion for this banquet feast, right? So Paul cites that passage from Isaiah 25 of our bodily resurrection, right? Not of Christ's resurrection, but of what is guaranteed by Christ's resurrection, our bodily resurrection. And so Paul says, the great feast of all the nations on Zion awaits us when this perishable body puts on imperishable. When this mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying in the prophets, that death is swallowed up and there's a great banquet on the heavenly Zion. Then we will say, now death for us is a defeated enemy. We are not afraid of it, but it does have a sting. Paul says we grieve. Jesus wept. Christians weep and grieve and mourn. We're, we are not um, stoics when it comes to death. Anyone who's buried a loved one understands that death still has a kind of sting for us. We grieve, but we do not grieve as those who have no hope. But eventually, at this moment, we will dance on the grave of death. We will taunt it. We will say to it, you are now swallowed up, not just in the physical body of Jesus, in the whole created order, swallowed up gulped down in the victory of Christ, now made cosmic and global, and we will taunt it, O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, sin will be over then. The power of sin is the law. The, 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 the grotesque nature of sin is such that, it, that it's a power that co-ops even the law and makes the law a force for our own condemnation. So sin and death and the law are like a triad of powers used by the demonic powers. All of those principalities and powers are destroyed here. Thanks be to God, Paul says, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We already now are tasting this victory, right? The Easter reality in Christ gives us participation in this victory. And that's why this is an Easter season text. And I want to conclude with this. I want you to see what Paul concludes and how he exhorts the church in light of these realities, right? In light of the future coming eschatological glory, what does he say to us? He says this, you're familiar, I'm sure with this. He says, therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast and immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. So what, again, what drives Paul is to drive us, namely the coming eschatological glory the coming resurrection from the dead is not a thing out there that we find very enjoyable and that we even look forward to. It penetrates back into the present and drives our work, our steadfastness, our immovability, our abounding in the work of the Lord. Because now we know, he says, that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. You know, it often looks like our labor's in vain. Institutions, families, churches, States, continents, centuries, 
They unravel sometimes. It's difficult to sort out what historical fruit we might see or, not, or might not see. We walk by faith and not by sight. But if we know that this is the future, that future determines our steadfast, immovable engagement with ministry and work and life now. We believe that our labor is not in vain because we believe in a God who can raise the dead and rectify the world and set things right. We don't believe that our labor is not in vain because we can clearly see that it's not in vain. Often it seems like it very much is in vain. Not always, not always, but many, many times it does. But Paul says, look, I've just spent 57 verses on the future bodily resurrection trying to convince you that it is your glorious hope and that it is the fuel or the engine that pervades my dying daily, my fighting with wild beasts at Ephesus, my working harder than all the apostles. And so I encourage you, he says, in the light of Easter, to be steadfast and immovable, always abounding in the Lord, knowing that because of this resurrection, your labor is not in vain. Let us pray. Oh Lord, our God, we are so thankful that Jesus is raised and that we have good news to preach. We have a gospel of first importance, a gospel which we receive and by which we are being saved and in which we stand. Enlighten the eyes of our hearts to know the hope of our calling, to know the glory of our current status in Christ and our coming inheritance in transfigured bodily, radiance and splendor. Oh Lord, this perishable flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And so we cry out for that moment, that twinkling of an eye, the sound of the last trumpet. Come Lord Jesus, let the spirit and the bride say, come Lord Jesus. And as we wait and watch, let us be steadfast and immovable, abounding in your work, knowing that in the risen Christ and in the pledge of a resurrected creation, none of the tears or the labors or the work or the prayers of your saints is in vain. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Blessings to all.